I now invite uh, Dr. Vanisa to talk about arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy. Is it showing it yet? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Great. Okay. Hello again. So um, thank you. So this talk is on arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy and using CMR for imaging. So um, ACM, uh, so we no longer call ARVC because we now recognize that the left ventricle can be involved, so it's now ACM. And uh, it can present uh, in a variety of settings, so the patient may present with arrhythmia, in particular VT or VF. They can have heart failure or they can have sudden death. And it's got implications for family members when somebody is diagnosed as well. So um, arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy, uh, you know, this is uh, what the pathological finding looks like on gross pathology and histopathology. And uh, this is a 40-year-old man, uh, asymptomatic, died suddenly. And in panel A, you see in vitro, it's a spin echo CMR, a four-chamber cut. It shows increased high signal, signal intensity in both ventricles. Um, it's either transmural on the right or subepicardial on the left. And in B, it's a view of the RV with fatty appearance of the lateral wall um, and the subtricuspid aneurysm and endocardial fibrous thickening. In C, there's a view of the postural lateral LV free wall, and you can see a wavefront extension of fat from the epicardium toward the endocardium. And D is a panoramic histologic section of the RV free wall showing transmural fibro fatty replacement. And E is a panoramic histologic section of the LV free wall with fibro fatty replacement in the outer layer. So this is what it looks like, and it helps to you know, know this in terms of the imaging that we see. So um, this is uh, the, uh, um, the histological section, and you know, in, in A, uh, you know, there are uh, fibroblasts and uh, infiltration and myocyte necrosis, and uh, you get to see that um, you know, in, in, in B, there's going to be some uh, vacuole changes, mitocytolysis. Um, you know, C, there's fibroblast infiltration and also fibrofatty replacement. And in D, um, you, you start to see, um, you know, there are just islands of myocytes left, and there's a lot of um, uh, adipose tissue and also fibrosis. So the first uh, diagnostic criteria were published by an international task force um, of experts in 1994, and they were later revised in 2010 um, uh, with an aim to increase the sensitivity for early diagnosis. And so there were some limitations, um, you know, of the 2010 criteria um, because it didn't involve the, the LV. And so um, these were the um, uh, MRI uh, findings, you know, at the bottom. So um, there were, you know, in, in this task force, you know, if you look at the top, there are definite borderline or possible ARVC depending on how many major or minor criteria you fulfilled. And so... Um, there were uh, uh, echo and CMR criteria. Um, you know, you're basically, um, you know, as a concept, you know, rather than looking at all these numbers, um, you know, let's just understand the concept. The concept is that you're looking for any regional or global RV dysfunction and structural alterations. And you can look for these using either echo, MRI, or RV angiography. So if you look at the MRI bit, um, you know, if you look at the major component, it's saying that, okay, you need to have regional RV something. So akinesia, dyskinesia, or dyssynchronous contraction, something regional about the RV. And then plus one of the following, either it's LV dilatation, and they define it you know, by those numbers over there, and B, you have to have RV ejection fraction that's abnormally low. And in this criteria, they've set that as 40%. Um, now, for minor, the concept is quite similar. You need to have a regional RV something abnormal plus 
um, you know, the, the R, now in terms of the RB dilatation, is something in between. Um, you know, it's like high normal LB volumes, and then for the ejection fraction, it's sort of just mildly impaired, you know, RB ejection fraction. So that that was the 2010 criteria, and of course, um, you know, it it doesn't have any LV criteria. And so um, in 2020, the, there was a new set of diagnostic criteria called the Padua criteria. Um, and the traditional organization in the six categories of those major minor criteria in the original um, you know, 2010 task force, they were maintained. Um, the criteria for identifying RV involvement were modified a little bit and then the new thing was there was a specific set of criteria of LV involvement. And so depending on the combination of these criteria, you can have one of these three things. So you can either have dominant right, so your conventional ARBC, um, so you would use a set of criteria like the updated 2010 criteria, and, uh, and you wouldn't usually see um, LV uh, abnormalities if in the dominant right category. And then on the left, you have dominant left uh, ALVC. So you're going to have to meet some LV structural criterion, plus you need to have the ACM gene mutation, some, you know, at least one of them. Um, and then in terms of RV, you might have no RV criteria, or you might have some minor RV criteria. So this is going to be a left dominant phenotype. And then you can have a combination, a biventricular phenotype, where you're going to fulfill both um, RV and LV criteria. So this is the basic concept and skeleton. So um, they will describe a very specific uh, echo and CMR criteria for these. And so um, to look at them a little bit more closely, in, in terms of the RV, the morpho-functional ventricular abnormalities are very similar to the 2010 criteria. Again, you need regional RV something plus either RV dilatation or RV systolic dysfunction. And so um, that's the, the concept there. And then the minor one would be just regional RV something, um, and, then, and, and that would be the minor. Now, you can look for structural abnormalities. So this is the new thing. Um, it now included LADGAD on CMR. CMR LADGAD for tissue characterization is now included in these criteria. And so um, you're going to have to look at the RV. Now, if in the RV, you have transmural LADGAD in at least one segment um, that's verified, that, that's a major criteria to have LADGAD in the RV. Um, or uh, you can diagnose it with endomyocardial biopsy. Um, now, not many centers you know, do this, and the indications for EMB are limited, but if on histopathology you see fibrous replacement of the myocardium in more than one sample, uh, with or without fatty tissue, you meet a major criterion. So the, these are new over here. And so now look at the, the LV. Now the LV uh, criterion are all new in this Padua criteria. So you can again, um, you know, fulfill these using echo, CMR, or angiography. And um, uh, the, these are minor criteria over here. And so again, global LV dysfunction. So you can either diagnose that with LVEF or um, reduce echo global longitudinal strain um, with or without dilatation. You don't have to have dilated LV. Um, and the minor criterion would be regional LV hypokinesia or akinesia of the free wall septum or both. Um, in terms of major, again, look at LADGAD CMR. So if you have LADGAD in the LV, in particular, the, the mid wall or those epicardial ring in more than one bullseye segment, um, you know, then this is going to be a major criterion, you know, especially, well, I'll show you later, you know, the ring-like LADGAD in AR, you know, in ACM, um, that's quite specific for something, so we should um, remember that pattern. So now echocardiogram, um, you know, it, it can obviously, you know, look at uh, bits of the LV, but they're not optimal. So this is a peristernal long axis. You, you see, you know, little bits of the LV. And, um, you know, you can look at the RBOT um, in some patients, but um, in this particular patient, you barely see anything because, because of the limited echo windows. Um, here is a short axis view, um, you know, clear LV, but um, the RV is not completely visualized. 
and this is the four chamber view. Um, you can miss uh, bits of the apex and the apicolateral wall. And so um, CMR um, can give you really clear views of the right heart. So you can see, um, you know, in a four chamber, the RV is very well visualized. You can have an RV two chamber view an RV three chamber view, that's the inflow, outflow, you know, where the tricuspid and pulmonic valve is, and also the RVOT view. Um, of course, you can have a short axis stack accurately quantifying the LV and RV volumes and ejection fraction. And um, additionally, we usually would do an RV transverse stack for the uh, ACM protocol. And this allows you to look at the RV free wall in some detail, especially for microaneurysms and regional RV wall motion abnormalities that's so important in the guidelines. So tissue characterization, Lagiad, um, you know, you, you can see the scarring within the ventricle. Um, you know, it, here you can see that there's sub-epicardio Lagiad. Um, you can see Lagiad in the RV uh, basolateral wall. You know, there are bits of GAD, you know, in the RV free wall, um, you know, mid-wall signs, you know, in the interventricular septum, also, you know, in the LV lateral wall, and you can see, you know, these sort of ring-like structures, uh, sub-epicardial and mid-wall. So the, these are quite well visualized using late guard. And so um, this is a case. So this is uh, an ACM confirmed to have the placophilin 2 PKP2 gene mutation. Um, so uh, this, it, this man was, uh, you know, he was fitted um, with an ICD for ventricular tachycardia before the diagnosis was even known, but that device had to be replaced because of a device infection. And then during that short space of time, without a device, the CMR was performed. And so the RVEF, um, you know, is quite depressed. It's 35%. Very dilated RV is 332 mils. And, um, you know, there are multiple regional wall motion abnormalities. You can see, you know, the RV free wall, you know, high hypokinetic, um, you can see it in this view as well. You know, very dilated uh, RV, as you can see in this three-chamber view of the LV, and also the lateral wall, you know, almost akinetic in some areas. And this is a short axis view um, of the LV, and you can see little bits could be dyskinetic and lateral wall akinetic. So definitely um, there are regional RV motion abnormalities, dilated LV, and depressed EF. So it meets, you know, a lot of the uh, major and minor criteria. And so these are the RV dedicated views. So the RV two chamber view, um, you know, showing, you know, here, you know, basal um, RV anterior wall, obvious wall motion abnormality. Um, in, and here, you know, in the inflow outflow tract, you know, the, this wall, you know, just not normal. Um, you know, just, it, it, it's quite extensive. This is the RVOT, again, RVOT, you know, not really contracting very well in the RV free wall and even in the, um, inferior wall. And here is the uh, transverse stack looking through uh, the entire um, range of the RV free wall. Again, you know, extensive regional wall motion abnormalities in the RV free wall that you can see very clearly using CMR. So uh, the late GAD, uh, this is what showed, um, you know, not so much late GAD in the LV. Um, you know, he does have some in the RV, but you can see that, you know, the pericardium is actually enhanced, you know, in this, in this patient. And um, here is the short axis views, you know, of that. And so um, you can see that, you know, some, some um, you know, inferior, RV inferior wall, you know, has some, has some gadolinium enhancement imaging. So another case, uh, this is uh, uh, another uh, gene confirmed. This is desmoplakin uh, truncating mutation. And so this is a 63-year-old man with confirmed ACM. Um, so it, it, it's a particularly bad uh, familial mutation that's caused extensive changes across the whole family in this patient. Um, and, and you can see that, you know, this... Uh, you know, the, the LV is involved here because the, the LVEF is only 34%. It is dilated. 
um, and the RVEF is also depressed. It's 43%. It is also dilated. So this is a biventricular phenotype, and you can see very clearly that there are aneurysmal changes in the RV free wall. Um, you know, these are, you know, these outpouchings over here, um, they are clear wall motion abnormalities. Um, you can see these, um, you know, also in the short axis, you know, when it runs through again, we'll wait for it to, to go through and concentrate on the RV. Um, you can see those regional wall motion abnormalities. So, you know, especially, you know, in the infralateral wall, the RV infralateral wall over at that corner over there, very obvious. So these are the dedicated RV views, uh, you know, for this patient. Um, you know, again, uh, you know, just many areas where it's not contracting normally. Um, this is the RVOT view. Um, this is the uh, inflow outflow tract uh, view of the RV, and um, you know, the, this is the, the transverse stack again running through the entire stack, looking at the RV free wall um, for regional wall motion abnormalities. I'll let that play. See these aneurysmal changes over there. And this is the, the late GAD pattern for this patient. And so um, very extensive late gadolinium enhancement all over the septum, LV lateral wall, um, LV inferior wall, and also the the RV, so you've got, you know, transmural leg gut over here, um, and you can see that, you know, in these views as well, a lot, a lot of leg gut. And these are the, the short axis views. And so, um, you know, see this sub-epicardio, you know, ring-like going all the way, and see in the RV free wall, look at all this gad in the, in the lateral wall and inferior wall of the RV, this ring-like, um, you know, pattern, Remember this pattern. This should absolutely raise alarm bells that this is a desmoplakin, or you know, it, it's it it it's this gene mutation gives you this this kind of pattern of leg gut. So desmoplakin cardiomyopathy. Um, you know, this paper in circulation. Um, it it's recognized as a specific type of cardiomyopathy. It's fibrotic, it's got an inflammatory component to it, and it is distinct from typical DCM or even ARVC. Um, so again, you know, remember that ring light pattern all over. It should, you know, ring bells to say this is a desmoplakin cardiomyopathy. So, um, you know, this is a, a predominant left ACM, um, again, due to a desmoplakin gene defect. So on the ECG, um, you know, you see these low voltages, um, you know, especially in the limb leads and, you know, flattened T waves, you know, in the infralateral leads. And um, on the uh, CMR, you see this, again, sub-epicardio, ring-like leg gad where the arrows are. Um, and, you know, in the long axis, it, it looks like that. So again, you know, quite a pathognomonic for this type of gene defect. And, you know, in the histologic sections, um, you see, um, you know, this fibro fatty myocardial replacement affecting the sub-epicardio LV layer. Um, and, you know, close-up, this is a close-up here showing residual myocytes within the fibrous and fatty tissue, you know, these, the vacuolus, you know, this fibro-fatty tissue. And so, uh, case three, this is um, a case courtesy of uh, Dr. Nitin Berkeley from uh, Jupiter Hospital, Mumbai. So this is a, a patient with no hypertension, diabetes, or smoking history. And um, he had presented with severe chest pain, significant troponin rise, um, no ECG changes really, and normal coronary angiogram. And um, he presented again uh, four years later with severe chest pain, positive troponins, again, no acute dynamic ECG changes, and again, normal coronaries. And so um, this is the, the ECG. Um, you know, they tend to have these kind of low voltage, you know, in, in the limb leads, um, and, and that could be a clue, but it's not very specific, obviously. And here are the CMR. So, you know, the RV, um, it's not dilated, but the RVEF is only 44%. The LV itself has mild dysfunction, 51%, and it's not dilated. So it's just biventricular, mild, uh, depressed uh, LV ejection fraction. 
And so um, uh, Dr. Berkeley did T1 mapping. So, um, you know, very increased global myocardial T1, and their upper limit was about 1250. So this is 1338, so quite significantly elevated. And T2 mapping also, um, you know, had elevated values, you know, about 53 milliseconds in the basal inferior septum and um, mid anterior wall, um, where, you know, there's some late yet, as we will see later, um, their upper limit was 50. And here are the late GAD images, again, showing this, uh, you know, quite striking mid-wall ring-like and sub-epicardial late GAD in multiple levels um, throughout the LV in particular. So this patient um, had a, a DSP mutation in exon 24. Um, you know, it was a recognized mutation, heterozygous, but autosomal dominant. It is um, recognized as a pathogenic variant that is causative of arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy. So that's what this patient had. And case four, uh, courtesy Dr. Vinita Orja from All India Institute of Medical Sciences in New Delhi. So this is a 29-year-old female, um, no prior comorbidities, but progressive shortness of breath for five months and palpitations for three months. Um, she's got some symptoms like abdominal distension and bilateral pedodema for two months and history of fever two weeks prior, but no family history of sudden death or coronary artery disease. And the ECG showed sinus rhythm, uh, but she had a right bundle branch block pattern. She had a lot of ectopy, ventricular premature complexes. It's 10% burden on the halter. And she actually had ventricular tachycardia with the right bundle branch morphology with a superior axis. And her echo showed biventricular systolic dysfunction, a right worse than the left. And the left, you know, was actually pretty bad too. It's 20%. Um, she had thinned out RV with massive dilatation, LV dilatation, and also severe TR. And again, no obstructive coronary artery disease. So um, she's got aneurysmal dilatation of the RV outflow tract and in the RV anterior wall, so dyskinetic. So we can see these clearly in the RV dedicated views. And um, uh, they did a T2 map and very um, elevated T2 values of 70 milliseconds, um, in, especially in the subepicardial layer of the infralateral wall. And you can see the stir here, um, you know, image quality wasn't so great in this patient. And so a uh, native T1 was elevated and the ECV was also elevated. And so um, they also did uh, something called a water fat separation late GAD. So sometimes you might um, be, you know, you might have difficulty telling, oh, is it sub-epicardial late GAD or is it epicardial fat? Um, well, you, you can have the sequence where it separates the two. So the um, up here in the top row, these are water only images. So whatever is enhancing, this is real, it's not fat. And this is the fat only images at the bottom and you don't see any fat enhancing signals. So this is true, um, you know, ring like subepicardial late GAD. And this uh, person underwent, again, you know, this, you know, ring rings a bell, this should undergo genetic testing. This was a desmoplakin mutation ACM. And you can see, you know, it, there's a late GAD as well in the, in the RV, um, as well as the LV, quite extensive. And so um, I think we may be, are we uh, on, on time? Do we have, uh, yeah, okay, all right. So this case five, again, um, from Dr. Nitin, a 43-year-old man, um, a borderline low LVEF, 45 to 50%. It was routinely on a health check. Um, on further questioning, mother had chemo-related DCM and heart failure mortality. Um, maternal grandfather died suddenly. The patient himself doesn't have hypertension or diabetes, and the stress um, MPI was negative. And so ECG, again, shows this sort of you know, low voltage, you know, in the limb leads, you know, but um, not so much, you know, the, the typical findings of ACM in, in the precordial leads V1, V2. And the echocardiogram um, is as shown. Um, so, you know, just sort of borderline um, low LV, um, you know, RV is not as well visualized. You know, there are some four chamber views, you know, over here. And um, these are the images of the RV, okay? 
And um, on the CMR, this is what is shown. So the LV, um, you know, has an ejection fraction of 50%. Um, it is dilated. And the RV has a low normal um, ejection fraction. So, you know, 52 is the lower limit of normal. It isn't dilated. But you can see this regional um, wall motion abnormality in the RV apex over there. And uh, you can also see in the short axis um, these regional wall motion abnormalities, both in the RV and in the LV. And so the late GAD, you know, shows, um, you know, this subepicardial late GAD again, um, especially in the lateral wall and inferior wall of the of the LV. And so this uh, patient underwent genetic screening, um, and it came back with, um, you know, some gene candidates. Um, so you've got this one here, you know, that's possible for, um, you know, DCM or HCM, you know, kind of uh, uh, combinations. Um, you've got this one, is DCM, and you've also got the desmoplakin gene truncation showing up um, that is known to be causative of ARVC. So it says here, there's a comment, you know, paternal parental testing is recommended and it can clarify some of the variants and it may change depending on the segregation analysis. So in summary then, ACM using CMR, so um, recognize that ACM could have different variants or phenotypes. It could be RB dominant, LB dominant, or you can have biventricular forms in the updated Padua criteria. Um, CMR is the imaging modality of choice for assessing the RV. Um, so you can accurately look at the RV and LV volumes function, and it can you know, give you strain as well. You can have RV, LV, late GAD, and you can use the water fat separation late GAD. Um, T1 and T2 mapping can detect inflammation and edema, but it's not yet part of the criteria for diagnosing ACM. Um, recognize that ring light pattern on LGE. Think desmoplakin cardiomyopathy. Patients should undergo gene screening. And CMR can accurately characterize the morphology, function, and tissue characterization in suspected ACM. And once a phenotype and pattern is recognized, you can consider genetic testing, and this can change patient management and also has impact on their family. So that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Mm -hmm. Vesperedo, for that wonderful talk. I throw open for questions to the audience. Can we give a mic to? Uh, small announcement. At, uh, today evening at 6.30, we'll be having the general body meeting of the uh, association. And I request all members to participate in the general body meeting. Thank you. Ma'am, we uh, generally uh, come across that asymptomatic patient and uh, just mild RV something, either dyskinesia or akinesia. RV EF normal, RV volumes, everything is within normal limit. So what should be the report from a radiologist? I see. Um, so uh, quite now, the simple thing is just describe the findings because you're not responsible for diagnosing the ARVC because the ARVC or ACM in general, you need multiple criteria. It's not just an imaging criteria. So you would r report that though you see regional RV wall motion abnormalities, you know, in this this area, and um, let's say you don't see any RV late yet, um, the RV volumes are normal and the RVEF is normal, and it's up to the referring physician to put it together because they need ECG criteria and other, like, you know, the family, you know, history is important and the personal history is important. So ACM is a diagnosis that requires multiple categories of things. So I could think the, the reporting could be kept, you know, to simple and just describe it. So for, for follow up, what could be the follow up after a one year or is there any? Criteria. Ah, yeah, I see. Yeah, so, you know, I don't think there's a set criteria, so it really depends on the clinical suspicion because if they have not found any causes and this is actually real, I mean, you may be picking up early ACM and they might want to just follow this patient up. Um, you know, one year sounds reasonable, um, you know, if they don't have anything else, if there's something, you know, that suggests that, wow, there's something really active going on, you know, inflammation, you know, et cetera, they might 
choose another time interval, but, uh, but yeah, it, this area is not sort of um, you know, standardized, if you will, but, uh, but it is a very good question because I'm sure the, the managing physician is also wondering about that. Yeah. Yeah, just one moment. Do you routinely do water side separation LG? Um, did, did you say the water separation? Fat, yeah, um, water fat separation LG no, that you talked about, which Vinita had given the case. I, I just missed your question. I'm so sorry. Do you routinely do that? Do I routinely do that? Oh, I see. Yeah. Um, no, uh, we, we don't routinely do that. But I think if the late GAD images pops up and you are unsure, you can move on and do that just to reassure yourself. Yeah. And, you know, if you have that sequence. But um, so is not yeah. available for oh, sale. So it's work in progress. Yeah, it's, a whip. it's probably a WIP package. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, but but to answer the question, no, don't I don't routinely do it, but you know if you're unsure, that's one method you can use. Yep. I'm sorry to be the spoil sport, but <laughs> we are running one hour late, and so we shall end questions. Can you please answer the rest during tea time? Absolutely. <laughs> please do come up, and we can have a chat. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Vanessa. <laughs>